question. In the JIT enabled mode, are we supposed to use tired compilation or use C to maximum optimization level? Not sure, Shivani, I, I never used it actually. So you try it out and see what happens. It's a question to learn, to experiment and learn. We can report what you found out using di different uh, compilation options. It's up to you. Or you can directly use maximum optimization level also. Okay, so far are you all doing good in the course? Just want to check how you are doing. Are you finding the course interesting? Any feedback you want to give? All right then, so let's get started. So, okay. So good morning everyone. Uh, so today's topic is introduction to syntax analysis. We will cover uh, uh, enough basic material so that you can get started with uh, the phase uh, the first phase of your project okay that is the goal for uh, today's lecture okay so just to recap you know like modern compilers they are architected uh, uh, as three phase compilers okay uh, or uh, in the first phase uh, is what is called as a front end. It's front end. The front end uh, takes the source program as input. It checks whether the program is uh, syntactically well formed or not. Okay, just okay. So this is the syntax analysis phase. And this is the phase one of the project. So the front end checks whether the program is syntactically well formed or not. And uh, after once the front end checks, uh, not only that, once the front end figures out that the program is syntactically well formed, uh, it constructs an AST representation of the tree and then there's a semantic check on this. That is the second step. Okay. And once uh, it uh, checks uh, that the program is uh, semantically well formed, uh, then it constructs uh, an alternate intermediate representation for the program. And this alternate uh, intermediate representation will be given to the uh, optimizer or the middle end of the compiler. Okay. For the next two, three weeks, we will be studying the front end of the compiler. Okay. And if you see all these, uh, each the front end optimizer, back end, they are not monolithic software, software components. Uh, they are uh, designed in a, a modular fashion. Okay. So let's see, uh, let's take a uh, dive into the front end and see. Uh, what are the major components in the front end? So as I said, so uh, in the front end, there are two, there are two components. One is called as a lexical analyzer or scanner. And the second is called as a syntax analyzer or a parser. Together, these two components, they will do syntax analysis. Okay. 
okay uh, and this is what we will be studying in uh, uh, today's class okay and in the next two three classes or even we have to spend at least uh, six classes on understanding this uh, how we design parser how we design scanner etc okay and then uh, as i said the syntax tree goes to uh, the semantic analyzer and then there is an intermediate code generator and during this process uh, the front end may use a data structure called as a symbol table in which it can store information about various functions that you are using in the program their signatures the variables declared in these functions their scope their lifetime lot of information he will store in the symbol table data structure okay so uh, now let's look at the uh, syntax analysis part of the front end okay so as i said there are two components in the syntax analysis uh, component one is called as a scanner or lexical analyzer uh, the second one is called as a parser so scanner is also called as in many books you will see scanner is also called as lexical analyzer okay scanner or lexical analyzer so uh, so if it let's take english language okay so if you take a document in an english language uh, a document is a collection of uh, uh, paragraphs okay or you can think of you know a document is a collection of chapters if you take a textbook a textbook is a collection of chapters and every chapter is a collection of sections and every section may contain subsections in them and every subsection may contain uh, is a collection of paragraphs and every paragraph is a collection of sentences and every sentence is a uh, sequence of words so if you want to uh, analyze an english language document so you finally have to get to the sentence level and then you have to uh, split the sentence into a stream of words okay it's so like for example so if you have something like you uh, know like uh, so rama killed ravana so this is an english language sentence okay so you want in order to understand this sentence you have to split this sentence into multiple words and associate for each of these words a parts of speech like for example you can divide this sentence into uh, four parts number one rama rama is uh, noun okay and then killed killed is a verb and you use no white space to split uh, to the to split the sentence into multiple words and then you have ravana again now and then there is the finally full stop which is a punctuation symbol so if you take natural language processing systems okay or like for example uh, you might be knowing about the grammarly which is a very nice tool to ch which checks whether your uh, uh, documents that you have written if there are any grammatical errors in it or even if you think about you know google docs uh, you will see uh, they try to find out any if there are any grammatical problems in your language okay so what these tools will do is they try to uh, construct a internal representation of your document okay so finally in, in the process of constructing an internal representation for your document they have to finally tokenize they have to split the sentences into each sentence into multiple words uh, and every word will be given uh, a parts of speech okay similarly uh, in programming languages also in order to do syntax analysis in order to check whether the program is syntactically well formed or not uh, so what we have to do is uh, we have to split that uh, uh, program or tokenize that program 
Like for example, if you take uh, a statement such as x is equal to x plus y here, uh, so uh, what the scanner module does is it takes this statement and tokenizes it. That means it splits this statement into words and assigns for every word a parts of speech. Like for example, the first token is uh, uh, id comma x, where x is the actual word. Okay, x is the actual word and the other uh, terminology that we use for it is lexeme okay and the associated parts of speech is id id means it's an identifier the next token it is a symbol uh, equal to and the next token again is again uh, this it has a, a, a token is a pair so the first part of the token uh, it tells the token type and the second part uh, uh, tells the actual word okay or the actual lexeme and then the fourth token is this uh, it's a plus plus like thing you can think of equal to plus etc as punctuation symbols in the english language like comma uh, full stop semicolon etc okay and then uh, this is token five this is token six okay so if you see token one and token three their token types are the same and uh, the associated words are also the same, associated lexemes are also the same. But whereas if you see token three and token five, uh, the token types are the same, but the associated words or lexemes are different. And if you look at token two, token four and token six, they don't have any token type uh, explicitly. Okay, they stand for themselves. And this is what the scanner module of the compiler is supposed to do. Okay. So let's see if there are any questions here before I proceed. Are there any questions? Okay, let's get going. So, and then, so what the parser does, the parser takes uh, as input a stream of tokens, okay, from the scanner uh, and checks if the stream of tokens constitute a syntactically valid program of the language. Okay, that's what the parser does. Take a stream of tokens and check if the stream of tokens constitute a syntactically valid program of the language. Okay. And if the input program is syntactically correct, then what it does is it constructs a concrete representation of the program like abstract syntax tree. Okay. And if the input has uh, any syntactic errors, then it outputs relevant diagnostic information back to the programmer. Okay. So this is what the parser does. There are two paths here. Either uh, if the program is syntactically well-formed, construct an intermediate representation uh, of the program like an AST. And if there are any syntactic errors, report those errors to the user back. So these are the two jobs of the parser. Okay. So now, the in order for the parser to check whether uh, a program is syntactically well formed or not, there should be a specification mechanism. Okay, so how do you specify the syntactic structure of a program? So here context free grammars come in uh, really handy. Like for example, if you consider the expressions in a programming language, they can be nicely expressed using the context free grammar that is there uh, on the screen. Okay, so for example, so uh, an expression is uh, uh, can be a term or an expression can be an expression operator term okay and uh, and what is a term a term can be a number or an identifier and what is an operator an operator can be plus or uh, minus okay 
So uh, the whole uh, idea of expressions, the syntactic structure of expressions can nicely be captured using uh, context-free grammars, okay? Just to recap, I guess you would have studied about context-free grammars in your uh, uh, automata theory course. So a context-free grammar, it consists of a collection of non-terminals. Like for example, in the context-free grammar that we have here, there are four non-terminal symbols. And these non-terminal symbols, they are denoted by uh, the, the capital letter N. Okay, N stands for non-terminal symbols. And there are four non-terminal symbols, goal, EXPR, term, and ob. And the notation that we use is uh, uh, non-terminal symbols, they start with capital letter. Okay, it is capital G here, capital E here, capital T here, capital O here. So non-terminal symbol starts with a, ca a capital letter. And the terminal symbols start with the small letter. In this language that we have, in the context-free grammar that we have here, there are uh, four terminal symbols, okay? One is number, it starts with a small case letter, ID, again, it starts with small case letter, plus and minus, these are the terminal symbols. And there will be a special non-terminal symbol, which is called as a start symbol or the goal symbol. So here, so S, S represents the start symbol, okay? So goal is the start symbol that we have here, okay? So now the question is given a stream of tokens, okay? So what is a token? So uh, every token is, uh, every token, think of a token as a terminal symbol in the, in the framework of context-free grammars. Given a stream of tokens or a given, of, given a stream of terminal symbols, uh, uh, the, and the syntactic specification uh, for the language in the form of a context-free grammar, uh, the question is, how can the parser check uh, whether the given uh, input statement matches, uh, is described by the context-free grammar specification? Okay, that is the question. So, if W is an input string, W, uh, sorry. So if W is a is an input string, okay, you want to check whether W belongs to the language described by the grammar G. Okay. I want you to, there are a couple of things I want uh, you to understand here. So earlier we were in the previous uh, uh, slide, we have seen a statement X is equal to X plus Y. Let's take the statement X plus two, okay. So we want to check whether X plus two uh, belongs to the language uh, de described by the context-free grammar that we are seeing in this slide, okay? If you see X and two, so X and two doesn't appear anywhere, okay? Uh, so, but what happens is uh, this X is internally, this X plus two is internally transformed into this. So it X ID plus, to number. So when we are checking whether X plus two belongs is described by this context-free grammar, what we are actually checking is uh, whether ID plus number belongs to the language described by the grammar. This is what we are checking. And later on, when we are uh, uh, doing semantic analysis and when we are doing code generation, then actually we pay attention to the actual word, the actual identifier, the actual number or constant that is being present in the expression. For the syntax analysis purpose, we don't need to actually worry about the actual word uh, X uh, or the constant two. All we check is whether uh, this ID plus two, we just pay attention to the token types, okay? And check whether the sequence of token types form a syntactically uh, well-formed programs, okay? Let me take a pause and see if there are any questions here. Are 
are there any questions I want you to understand this particular idea that when we are considering a statement such as x plus 2, what happens is the scanner will generate the sequence of three tokens. Okay, like uh, so this is uh, token 1, this is token 2, this is token 3. So the scanner will generate the sequence of three tokens. And uh, the parser, you don't need to pay attention to the X and 2. It just considers the sequence of token types, that is ID plus number, and checks whether that forms a syntactically well-formed sentence uh, as per the context-free grammar given. Okay. I guess you're all doing good. So let me... Move on. Yeah. So now you can easily see, like for example, how we can use context-free grammars to specify syntactic structure of all the expressions that you get in your C programming language, for example. Okay. So what is an expression? An expression is, uh, uh, you take two expressions and you connect them through a binary operator. Then you get an expression. Okay. Sorry. I'm just trying to get my pen here. Just give me a moment. Okay, so an expression uh, is uh, take two expressions and you connect them through a binary operator, then you get an expression. Or you take, this is very important, so this vertical bar it stands for or. Okay, or you take an expression and you put a minus operator before it, unary minus operator before it, you get an expression. Or you take an expression and you put an exclamation negation operator before it, you get an expression. Or you put parentheses around expression, you get an expression. Okay, great. And uh, what is a binary operator? A binary operator can be an arithmetic operator or it can be a relational operator or it can be an e e uh, equality, I mean comparison, equality comparison operator or conditional operator. And what is an arithmetic operator? An arithmetic operator can be plus, minus, star, divided, so on and so forth. Similarly, a relational operator can be less than, greater than, less than or equal to, so on and so forth. So you can see uh, pretty much all the uh, syntax of uh, syntactic structure of uh, uh, expressions that you see in any programming language, you can nicely specify using context-free graph. That is the power of context-free grammars. Okay. So two ideas that I want you to uh, understand, uh, appreciate uh, here. The first idea, uh, the, the first idea is uh, uh, multiple possibilities. Okay. So an expression can be one of these. Okay. An expression can be one of. Uh, this okay that is either uh, no like for example either this or this or this or this okay so this is a very very powerful feature the second uh, important thing that you have to appreciate here is uh, uh, there is a recursion recursive so you define expressions in terms of uh, expressions you use recursion to specify the definition use recursion to specify the definition and these two features turns out to be extremely powerful uh, uh, and they they give the real power to the context free grammars okay so that is uh, an expression for example in this context an expression can take one of these four different uh, structures 
that is the first thing. The second thing is when we are defining an expression, in the definition of expression, we are using the expression itself. Okay, there is a recursive specification there. So these are the two things which give real power to context-free grammars. Okay, we will, uh, so if, for example, if you take a program, okay, let's, uh, so if you look at the context-free grammars and programming languages, again, so uh, all programming languages, pretty much they can be uh, expressed using context-free grammars. Okay, and this is uh, by design, okay? Because once you are able to specify the st syntactic structure of uh, a programming language using context-free grammars, then the specification, the syntactic specification will be very crisp, okay, number one. Uh, number two is, uh, uh, it is easy to use, uh, uh, to design parsers, okay? And you can use uh, uh, many parser generator tools also in the construction of uh, the front end of your uh, syntax analyzer component of the front end, okay? So as we have seen, uh, so uh, how context-free grammars have uh, gained their expressive powers? Let's try to understand it by going beyond expressions, okay? So now let's take a program, okay? So let's, if you take a C program, a C program could be spread in multiple files. Okay, and now let's take a program within a file. A program within a file, it is a collection of uh, functions, right? And uh, what is a function? A function is a sequence of statements. And what is a statement? A statement can be an if statement, or it can be a while statement, or it can be a for statement, assignment statement, so on and so forth. And now let's see how a while statement looks like. A while statement is nothing but a sequence of uh, statements. Uh, similarly, you now if you look at uh, no, arithmetic expressions which we have seen before, an arithmetic expression is a sum or product of two arithmetic expressions. So if you see the two things that, uh, have that we have seen before, they are coming into play. Number one uh, is this. A statement can be one of these uh, uh, three, four uh, structures. Okay, A statement can be any of uh, uh, if, while, for, assignment statements, etc. Okay, so this is uh, this is the first thing that we have seen before. One of uh, the, it can take one of the forms, one of these forms. The second thing is while uh, defining a statement, uh, while defining, for example, how a while statement looks like, we are again using statements. Okay, so there's a recursion, okay. So we are here. We are saying a statement it can be a while statement, and then here we are saying a while statement again. It consists of statements. Okay. So here, recursion is coming into picture. Okay. Here, recursion is coming into picture. Okay. And context. So you are usually your programs have these recursive structures, and context-free grammars are a nice way of expressing programs with recursive structure. Okay. So now let's see the grammar for a. Uh, statement okay so here a statement can be an assignment statement this is an assignment statement what is the structure of an assignment statement the lhs is a location and the, uh, and the rhs is an expression okay so this is a assignment statement a statement can be an assignment statement or it can be a method call or it can be an if statement okay uh, and uh, it can, or it can be an if then else statement, okay? Or it can be a while statement, or it can be a continue statement, or it can be a break statement, or it can simply be a block also, okay? And uh, and what is a block? A block starts with a left flower bracket, okay? And then it ends with a left flower bracket. In between, at the beginning of the block, we have a variable declaration list followed by a statement list, okay? And what is a statement list? A statement list is can consist of either a single statement or statement followed by statement list, okay? So you can see nicely how the syntactic structure of your programming language can pretty much be summarized in one slide, 
okay so that is the power of context free grammars okay in fact for your uh, project that is phase 1 of the project you can use the structure that is present here and uh, specify the uh, syntactic come up with a context free grammar specification for the programming language uh, you are going to design okay so i want to highlight few things so here equal to is a terminal symbol okay left parenthesis right parenthesis if okay if is also a terminal symbol okay it's a uh, while is also a terminal symbol okay continue is a terminal symbol right uh, semicolon is a terminal symbol these are all starting with small letters so if you see the terminal symbols the set of terminal symbols here all keywords are terminal symbols all keywords are if while continue these are all terminal symbols okay and then things such as left parenthesis right parenthesis semicolon okay uh, left forward bracket right forward bracket all these things they form uh, uh, terminal symbols okay so you are input program so you are lexical analyzer what it does is it takes the input program and generates a stream of token types and passes it to the parser and the parser uses those tokens to check whether they form a syntactically well formed program or not by using this context free grammar specification as the base okay so let me take a pause here and see if you have any questions we have any questions here so the most important part for today's lecture is uh, this particular slide and you uh, know the and uh, and the particular idea that how we tokenize x plus 2 into the sequence of three tokens if you just remember these two things then uh, you can get started on doing on the project because uh, i will be releasing uh, the project uh, today so i want you to understand these ideas as well so that you can get started on the project and uh, you know stay on the top of the things any questions you are all doing good so ankush has a question so the grammar is ambiguous uh, uh, in slide 7 and uh, the precedence and associativity are not maintained good question okay so very good question ankush so yes the grammar is ambiguous uh, the associativity is also not uh, mentioned here so we will revisit uh, so we will discuss uh, this ambiguity in grammars and uh, so because of the ambiguity in the grammar uh, the precedence and associativity are not properly set so we will discuss this in the next class okay so good question but what i want you to uh, appreciate is uh, uh, in the lexical in the syntax analyzer that you are going to design using the antler tool uh these things are automatically taken care of okay so there's a nice way to take care of them without uh, changing your uh, grammar much okay nice so what are the advantages of using context free grammars to specify syntactic structure of languages so number 1 uh it's clear it and concise syntactic specification for languages like as we have seen pretty much for uh, probably for 80% of c programming language you are able to specify the syntax within one slide okay and uh, number 2 languages can be de developed and uh, evolved iteratively uh so like for example you know the grammar that is given uh in the in the slide is only 80% but if you want to add more constructs you can add to it okay like for example uh, you know uh, 
uh, I said statement can be an if statement, while statement, but later on you decided to add a new construct such as do while statement. Okay. So do something while something is true. You want to add a statement like this. Then you can add the structure as one of the rules, uh, as one of the alternatives uh, for the productions corresponding to the statement not earlier. In fact, I would like you to use this uh, approach while building the parser. Don't put everything together. So just add initially assignment statement to your programming language, debug your syntax analyzer component. After the assignment statement is working, add while statement and see if everything is looking good. And then after that, add for statement and see, you know, it's uh, your syntax analyzer is working good. So don't throw in all the substitution rules and uh, no, see what is happening. So you may get uh, hundreds of errors and it may become hard for you to debug. So develop your syntax analyzer in a very incremental fashion. Okay. Uh, this, the, the next important thing is, so if you just take context-free grammars, you know, like if you, uh, and if you want to check whether a string W belongs to the language described by a grammar okay so the general algorithm uh, in the worst case it may take theta of n cube time where n is the length of the input uh, string okay uh, but there are algorithms where if the grammar is not ambiguous you might be able to do it in uh, n square time okay but we are not happy with cubic times or you uh, know or quadratic times we want to see if we can do it in linear time, this is theta, okay? So, uh, so for a subclass of context-free grammars, usually these subclass of context-free grammars are sufficient or powerful enough to express the syntactic structure of programming languages. For these uh, subclass, it is possible for us to uh, generate uh, linear time parsers, okay? Uh, there are two things here. Number one is efficient, okay? That is where the linear time parsing thing comes into picture. Number two is automatic parser generators. Okay, that means uh, you give the grammar and a parser will be automatically generated. And that's what the uh, antler does. Okay, in the last year we used the parser generator that we used uh, in the last year version of the course is Bison. And this year you can use antler uh, to generate the parser. These are called as parser generators. Okay, so this is where uh, the power of context-free grammars uh, comes into picture. Okay, and also ambiguities will all can automatically be taken care of for the subclass of uh, grammars. Okay. So finally, so context-free grammars impose a structure on the program which facilitates easy translation to intermediate or target object. So these are the advantages of using context-free grammars in specifying syntactic structure of uh, languages. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, the, the parse trees. So you might have studied about these parse trees in your automata theory course, uh, but uh, we'll review them here once. So like for example, here, the parse tree associated with the grammar for the expression x plus two minus one, and for the grammar that we have considered some time back uh, is this, okay? so. You know that there is a symbol you start with the goal and you know there is a substitution rule or production called as goal goes to expr so you use the substitution rule to move from here to here and then you know like there is one more substitution rule called as expr goes to expr op term and you use that substitution rule to expand this parse tree further okay and then again, you use the same substitution rule to expand this expr node to expr of term. And there is one more substitution rule, if you recall, which is expr goes to term. So you use that substitution rule to say expr goes to term. And finally, you know, what is the term? Uh, a term is, uh, can be, there's a substitution rule called as a term can be an identifier. So you, so, and then, uh, uh, so you use that substitution rule to match the first token in the input. So the first token in the input is uh, id comma x, okay, where id is the token type and x is the actual word. So what you are seeing here, it's a parse tree, uh, 
uh, given corresponding to the input uh, string x plus 2 minus y. If you are able to successfully construct a parse tree for a programming, for a, for a given input statement, then we say, uh, then the statement belongs to the language described by the grammar. So we say x plus 2 minus 1 belongs to the language described by the grammar because, uh, so why? Uh, successfully able to construct a parse tree. Okay, able to construct a parse tree. But if you see the parse tree contains lots of derivation information. So all the uh, non-leaf nodes, they are uh, non-terminal symbols, okay, non-leaf nodes, okay, internal nodes, internal or non-leaf nodes. So they correspond to non-terminal symbols, okay, non terminal symbols, whereas all the leaf nodes, they correspond to terminal symbols. Okay. So, uh, but uh, the once the, but the compiler phases, which compiler passes that come down the lane, they actually don't require all this uh, uh, derivation information, okay? So we can come up with a more compact representation for the derivation, uh, uh, for the uh, input statement, okay? Like this is a, this is what is called as an abstract syntax tree. This abstract syntax tree captures the structure of the input uh, statement, okay? And it doesn't contain all the unnecessary derivation information. The derivation information is necessary to check if the, the statement is syntactically well formed or not. But once we check that the, the program is syntactically well formed or not, all the derivation information is not necessary. We need a much more uh, uh, compact representation, okay, much more compact representation, which will be useful for uh, various analysis passes and transformation passes. Okay, so what we have here is a is what is called as an abstract syntax with no derivation information. Okay, so this AST is very crucial because uh, you know uh, once we have the AST immediately you can interpret the AST. Like for example, you can do statement evaluation. Okay, you can do expression evaluation on this AST, or you can do type checking like for example you can check you know if the type the, the type of the left side node is uh, uh, is a uh, let's say this is character okay let's assume that x is a character type it has char type and the type of the right side node it's an inter type so if, if the particular programming language doesn't allow addition between char and int you can raise a semantic error while doing expression evaluation or even if you are not uh, uh, doing evaluation, you can make a AST pass and check whether there is type compatibility between two subtrees of a node in the AST tree. Okay. Or let's say even you know, let's say even if uh, ID, okay, if this is an int, okay, this is int, this is int. So the type of this node is int, but Y could be a float, okay. And in the particular programming language, we, we are not permitted to do a difference operation between an int and float, then you can raise a semantic error here. Okay, so that's how uh, your uh, ASTs can help you in doing uh, semantic analysis or type checking. Okay, or you can do an in order traversal of uh, your uh, AST and say generate something like statements for a stack machine such as push x, push to, add, add, what add does is it pops the top two operators on the stack and pushes the same onto the, uh, and the compute do the addition operation, pushes the result back onto the stack and then you can say push y and then you can say subtract. So you can do code generation for a stack machine, for a simple stack machine you can do code generation.
Okay. So there are three things that we are we have seen now. Number one, once we have the AST, we can do semantic analysis, type checking. This is what uh, we have seen. Number two, we can actually do interpretation. Okay, that is evaluation of the tree. Number three, we can do code generation. That's it. So these are the important things in the design of a compiler. Okay. Great. So this is the AST for this particular, uh, for the expression that you are seeing on the left hand side. Uh, so one important thing is uh, for the same uh, uh, language, okay, for the same language, you can arrive at different context free grammars. Like for example, here, uh, this is the first, uh, so in this, if you see the context free grammar here, let's call it as G1, okay, in the context free grammar G1, uh, so the non-terminal symbols are goal, EXPR, okay, uh, term, and the terminal symbols are, the terminal symbols are off is a terminal symbol, number is a terminal symbol, ID is a terminal symbol. Okay, so uh, if you have and uh, so op is a terminal symbol, uh, it's a token type. Uh, there are two kinds of operators, plus and minus. So if you have something like x minus two, the way it gets tokenized is x is an identifier, okay, and then you have minus minus is an operator, and you have so two is a number. Okay, this is how a statement such as x minus 2 gets tokenized uh, in this particular uh, using the first uh, grammar okay in order to make this interesting let's make this as xy okay xy is an identifier and if you look at the second uh, grammar this is grammar g2 the way it gets tokenized is you say xy it is an identifier okay and the second token is uh, minus minus is the second token and uh, the third token is uh, two comma number. Okay. So one thing that you have to appreciate here is, so here between the grammar G1 and G2, there is one less substitution rule in uh, grammar uh, two, in grammar one, when compared to grammar two, that is these two substitution rules, they are merged into one rule here. So let's say if you in your particular programming language, if, if there are 10 different operators, in, if you take the path of grammar two, you will have 10 different substitution rules. But whereas if you take the path of grammar one, you will have only one substitution rule. So as the number of substitution rules decrease, usually the time taken to parse also decreases. Okay, so, uh, so it has its advantages, okay. But grammar G1 and G2 both are fairly all right, okay. Agreed that grammar G1 is slightly more optimal than grammar G2, but it is not a big deal, okay. It's okay, okay. So like for example, when you are designing a, your own uh, uh, parser uh, or specifying context-free grammar for your programming language, even if you use no grammar G2, it is all right, not an issue. Don't worry about it. But grammar G1 or grammar, let's say G0, Okay, this is uh, very uh, pathetic. So here, uh, what happens is uh, the structure of the identifier is also specified using context-free grammars. You are saying, you know, uh, an expression uh, is expression of term and a term, term can be a number or it can be an ID. So here number and ID, they are not uh, uh, terminal symbols, but they are non-terminal symbols. So they have to be, they are further defined. Like for example, a number is a number followed by digit or a digit or an identifier is alphabet followed by ID or alphabet and where alphabet is one of these 26 possibilities. So what happens is if you have a statement such as X, Y minus two, then the way it gets parsed is, uh, you know, uh, the way it gets uh, converted is uh, X, okay. X is a, uh, so X, X is C, it will have some kind of, uh, no, let's say it's a token type is uh, car, 
okay and similarly actually it's not even this okay let me okay so the way this uh, xy minus 2 gets parsed is uh, you just the lexical analyzer it just sends xy minus 2 to the parser and the parser does all the hard work okay this is a bad lexical uh, analyzer design or parser design because you are unnecessarily bloating the size of the parser with too many substitution rules okay so you would pretty much the lexical analyzer doesn't do anything it just reads a character and sends it to the parser and parser needs to do all the hard work Okay, so this is a bad design. So you don't want to take this design in your uh, syntax analyzer. Okay, so in order to make this idea more clean, so when you take a programming language, you have what is called as a micro syntax and what is called as a macro syntax. So the, mac the micro syntax, the rules in the micro syntax, they govern the lexical structure of the language. Okay, uh, like for example, what is the lexical structure? So how does identifiers look like? Structure of identifiers, okay? Structure of uh, int literal, okay? Structure of float literal, okay? Structure of string literal, okay? All these things, they constitute what is called as a micro syntax of the language. This is the micro syntax, okay? Whereas the macro syntax consists of how does a statement looks like? Okay, statement. How does a statement looks like? This is a macro syntax. Okay, how does an if statement look like? How does a block look like? Okay, so all these things they constitute the macro syntax of the language. So the micro syntax of the language, the micro syntax of the of a language can be specified using regular expressions and this is what we will see in the next class and we can uh, design we can uh, and uh, we can realize uh, a tokenizer okay from the specification of the micro syntax in the form of regular expressions using finite state machines this is what we see in the next class whereas uh, the macro syntax of the language okay that is uh, the which gives you which tells you, you know the how statements look like how a block looks like how does a function look like okay so they have to be specified using context free grammars and we have to use push down automata to uh, realize this uh, to check whether a string given is uh, described by the context free grammar that is given so this is what we do okay so this second part we study in the theory of parsing Okay, in the theory of parsing, we study this. And uh, in the next class, we will take up this. How can we specify the micro syntactic structure of a programming language? That is number one, using regular expressions. Number two, once it is specified using regular expressions, how we can automatically go about designing a scanner uh, using the theory of a finite automata or finite state machines is what we study in the next class. Okay, so there are two things here. So why can't we encode the micro syntax of the language into the grammar for the macro syntax? So as I have said before, so uh, parsing is a much more harder job than uh, uh, than you uh, uh, than using uh, than lexical analysis. So you can just do recognize the you no, know, you can easily tokenize your uh, program into a sequence of token types without resorting to push down automata, without resorting to context free grammar, so on and so forth. And also it makes your grammar too clumsy, okay? Uh, but on the contrary, it's not possible for you to specify the syntactic structure of statements, blocks, etc., using regular expressions. It's not possible. You have to rely on context free grammars to get that done, okay? So basically the idea here is, so separation of micro syntax, okay, from the grammar, separation of micro syntax from the grammar gives a clean grammar for the core programming language constructs. Keep this idea in mind, okay? 
and the second thing is this is from the software engineering perspective okay this is from software engineering perspective the second important thing is from the efficiency perspective efficiency perspective every grammar rule that you drop it shrinks the size of the parser because parsing is more harder and slower than lexical analysis so to summarize don't lift a needle with a crane so use the you know, simplest tool possible to solve a given task that is the summary of uh, this discussion on micro syntax versus macro syntax so this brings us to the conclusion of today's lecture uh, i will uh, take any questions that you may have now so just want to say i will release uh, the phase one of the project uh, by evening so start working on it so time now is 11:28 so <clears throat> so those of you who want to drop off because you have another class or uh, you are all good with the class it's fine but if you have any questions please stay back and ask me